My name is Ira Milstein. I'm a partner at Wild Gotchel and Angie's, and I'm here simply to welcome you on behalf of the firm uh, to this meeting. We're very, very proud to be the host for Columbia Business School and Columbia Law School uh, and the Richmond Center, uh, starting what we hope is a series of long programs in the future which are going to carry out a lot of what uh, we hope will be groundbreaking studies in a variety of areas. I, I think this is the first of uh, the big programs for the Richmond Center in which we're introducing the great partnership between the business school and the law school, which is why I'm happy to be uh, able to host it and why the firm, which has had a long relationship with Columbia, is uh, delighted to host it and we hope we'll be hosting many of them going into the future. I promised Charles I would not step on any toes with respect to academics, because that's not my business, allegedly. And uh, I will now introduce you to Charles Calamaros, who has been my partner in organizing this and a distinguished scholar from Columbia Business School, Charles. And let me just say, I think Rich Richmond ought to stand up for a minute for having had here, the wisdom. Here. I mean, it was his magnificent grant which got the partnership between Columbia Law School and Business School started. And I think it was a great thing. We're going to be leaders in that area. Charles? Thanks, Ira. Um, and thanks to Wild for hosting us today. Um, it is the beginning of a very exciting partnership. Our colleagues at the Business School and the Law School are going to be getting together, we hope, for a lot of similar such events. and. Um, let me just say that, uh, to emphasize, this is, we hope, the first of a series of events on this sort of topic and on uh, other uh, topics of interest. It makes a lot of sense to have um, economics and finance professors and law professors and professionals and regulators sitting together in the same room uh, discussing these topics. Uh, I won't talk much about the sessions except to say that uh, something that happened to me that's never happened before, which is when we sat down and put together our list of people that we wanted to have here, every one of them accepted. And I think the secret was sending them a list of all the people that we had on the program. Uh, it is really an all-star cast. Now I have some housekeeping things to tell you and then we'll get started. We have people from the press here today. We're very excited about that. Uh, and in case you're wondering, Chatham House rules are not in effect. Repeat, not in effect. So we're letting the press take people uh, on the record today. Um, we're also allowing all attendees, including reporters, to use social media throughout the conference. Now, I don't even know what social media are, <laughs> but Apparently, I've got a parenthesis here, such as tweeting. So we are allowing tweeting, but try to do it quietly. <laughs> and uh, we're, we're, we're trying to make sure that the people from the press will have an opportunity to ask questions. So we're going to reserve, we're going to have 20 minutes of Q&A for each session and reserve the last, I don't know, six or so minutes to make sure that uh, people from the press will be able to uh, have a chance to ask their questions. So we're thinking sort of more of a sort of a conceptual academic kinds of questions and then followed by any questions that people from the press want to ask. Uh, not that they can't ask conceptual questions too. Finally, uh, in addition to thanks to uh, Richard Richmond, I'd like to thank my co-organizer Ira Milstein. It's been a real pleasure and a privilege working with him. And now I'll turn it over to Ed. Thank thanks. you. I'm pleased to moderate this panel. Uh, what we view it as is an uh, overview of the post-crisis regulatory landscape, uh, providing a foundation for the discussion we will have in subsequent panels. Let me introduce briefly the panelists, but you can read much more about them in the handy uh, booklet that's been provided to you. Immediately to my left is Rajan Co Cohen, uh, senior chairman and partner of Sullivan Cromwell, and a major player in most of the major US bank acquisitions during the crisis. To his left is Harvey Miller, partner and founder of the business restructuring department at Weill Gottschall, where he has led the most important corporate restructurings in the United States, most recently Lehman Brothers and General Motors. 
And finally, to Harvey's left is Mark Carey, Senior Advisor in the Division of International Finance of the Federal Reserve Board. And he was, so to speak, a founding father of Basel II. Now, with those brief introductions, I'm going to, we're going to turn it over to the panelists to spend about 12 to 15 minutes offering impressions of the regulatory landscape. Once that ends, we'll turn it over to the audience to, to, to a Q&A discussion. And I want to uh, alert you that we are trying to uh, uh, record the proceedings uh, for the Richmond Center. And so when, when we invite you to ask a question, uh, please wait for the microphone so that we can hear your question, and so can posterity. Um, and with that, Rajan, why don't you take it from here? Thank you very much, and, and good morning. It's a real pleasure to be here with you today, particularly with my distinguished co-panelists, Ira and Charles. Our topic this morning is the current state of play for Dodd-Frank and Basel. And let me begin by suggesting that a comprehensive revision of the U.S. regulatory system for financial institutions was compelled by the serious regulatory flaws exposed by the financial crisis of 2007 to 2009. As we all know, that crisis threatened the very fabric of our financial system. Let me identify four principal regulatory flaws. First, a number of key regulatory standards were too lax or administered too laxly. Second, there was no comprehensive government planning for dealing with the failure of major financial institutions and no effective resolution process, which led to actual implementation of too big to fail. Third, a major element of the financial system, the so-called shadow banking system, was virtually exempt from regulation. And fourth, there was a serious breakdown in consumer protection. My thesis today is that there has already been a rigorous and effective response to the first, second, and fourth of these flaws, and that there is a framework in place for dealing with the third. This response is obviously not perfect, nor could it be. Uh, regulation will always be a work in progress as financial institutions and the financial system evolve. And there are some substantial flaws in the present regulatory revisions but very substantial progress has been made. Let me start with the new regulatory standards, which to date have actually been more of a function of supervisory efforts than formal regulation, the two most important, capital and liquidity. A principal flaw in the pre-crisis regulatory system was the failure to adopt and enforce more robust capital standards in terms of both quantity and quality. There was a strong correlation between abnormal leverage and severe financial distress. In response, there have been multiple supervisory and regulatory efforts to require U.S. banking organizations to bolster their capital, and the results have been impressive. The Tier 1 common ratio of most large U.S. banks have doubled in relation to the period immediately before the crisis. Moreover, the supervisory efforts are ongoing in large part through the stress test regime of the Federal Reserve. All 30 U.S. banking organizations with assets exceeding $50 billion were recently required to undergo a stress test for the largest 19. It was the third time around. This time, there were truly draconian macroeconomic assumptions. They included an unemployment rate of 13 percent, a further housing price decline of 20 percent, and a 50 percent decline in the Dow Jones. In addition, the Fed appeared to use very conservative models in applying these assumptions. Now, notwithstanding an extraordinarily stressed approach, 18 of the 19 large banks passed if you exclude proposed capital actions and 15 on any basis. These stress tests have demonstrated more robust capital, more resilient capital, and improved capital planning. And I find it amazing that even the self-anointed scourges of the banking industry could criticize the stress tests as being too lenient. Supervisory action has also promoted capital growth by placing far more stringent limits on capital actions, such as dividends and stock buybacks. The average dividend payout ratios and stock repurchases have declined sharply. In terms of formal regulation, the Fed has proposed enhanced prudential uh, standards for the largest banks, 
that it would incorporate the new Basel III capital regime. And here you have both higher capital standards and focus on the highest quality of capital, which is common stock. In addition, you have the special capital surcharges of 100 to 250 basis points, which would be applied to the 29 banks deemed globally significant. Less readily demonstrable, but clearly there, the bank supervisors have required banks to maintain substantially higher liquidity positions. The Federal Reserve's proposed enhanced supervision rule would also incorporate the Basel III liquidity regime, albeit with significant modifications to provide a more realistic evaluation. You have both a liquidity coverage ratio, measuring liquidity at 30 days, and a net stable funding ratio, which is designed to ensure liquidity over a one-year time horizon. In addition, the Fed's proposed rule would require a very rigorous liquidity management approach at each bank. The overall supervisory regime has become much more rigorous with respect to numerous other matters, risk management, asset quality evaluation, board participation, single party exposure, living wills, and early remediation. The second issue is the resolution of large financial institutions and the elimination of too big to fail. Dodd-Frank attacks the issue through multiple provisions. Title II provides a new special resolution regime for systemically significant financial institutions. It is designed to end too big to fail by first eliminating the potential for favorable treatment for the resolved institution's stockholders, funders, and management and second, to establish a sufficiently effective and credible resolution structure so that an actual failure is feasible without significant systemic risk and taxpayer exposure. Now, I'm, we may receive a fairly vigorous challenge from Harvey, but I find it difficult to understand that this special resolution regime has failed to eliminate too big to fail. If you have a systemically significant institution that goes into the special resolution program, the shareholders must be wiped out, its management replaced, and its creditors held responsible for any losses. Moreover, there is no option to a government-controlled liquidation, whereas a non-financial institution can seek rehabilitation under Chapter 11. In addition, Dodd-Frank bars the Fed from using its special lending authority under Section 13.3 of the Federal Reserve Act to benefit a single institution, and this had been a critical weapon for too big to fail rescues during the financial crisis. The effectiveness of the new resolution regime cannot, of course, be assured, but there are a number of key provisions which provide a solid foundation, including the possibility of a bridge company, a prompt payment to creditors and liquidity availability from the Treasury, and creditors are assured of a recovery no less than they would have received under a Chapter 7 liquidation. Now, sure, at some time in the future, could you have emergency legislation to save a single institution from failure? Yes, but I would suggest it will be very long a long time before an administration would ask Congress to take such action and perhaps even longer before Congress would run the risk of committing political suicide by responding positively. Dodd-Frank's principal response to the breakdown in consumer protection was, of course, the creation of a new Consumer Financial Protection Bureau with broad powers and virtually unlimited funding. Although the CFPB's implementation was delayed by a confirmation fight over the director, it is now actively examining most of the major banks and establishing new standards. Another key tool in providing consumer protection is a much more vigorous enforcement regime. Just one example is the $25 billion settlement for the five leading mortgage servicers. Now, the one which is a work in progress is regulation of the shadow banking system. Uh, that's uh, indeed more a work at this point in concept. Uh, we still don't have any significantly uh, signi significant institutions designated as such, uh, so we're waiting. Now, in the last couple of moments, I want to address briefly the argument that this regulatory revision is not enough, and what we need is a financial system restructuring. 
The proponents of a financial system restructuring really advocate a government-mandated breakup of the largest banks so that no bank is too big. This could be done directly or through size-based, highly restrictive regulation. In attempting to be informative without being pejorative, I would note that some of the strongest supporters of this big as bad approach in the financial crisis's aftermath had called for nationalization of our banking system during the crisis. Although a breakup approach has obviously not been achieved, elements of each are found in a series of regulatory and legislative developments, most of which are quite troublesome. These include the Fed's broad interpretation of the financial stability factor for evaluating bank acquisitions, the previously mentioned capital surcharge based on size, and the accompanying threat of an even higher uh, capital surcharge if a so-called GSIB has a temerity to grow, the tester amendment which changed the assessment base for deposit insurance from domestic deposits to assets, and the Volcker rule. A principal concern about the breakup approach relates to its impact ultimately on the broader economy. If our largest financial institutions are compelled to reduce their size, who will make the loans that they previously made and are necessary to fuel our economic recovery? Now, some purport to speak with certainty that all that slack will be taken up by smaller banks and even the shadow banking system. But do we want to see rapid loan growth in our smaller banks or any loan growth in the shadow banking system? Of more importance, how confident can one be that these other financial institutions will make these loans? Are we willing to bet the economic recovery? More generally, any financial services regime will ultimately be counterproductive if it fails to recognize that financial institutions are, after all, in the risk-taking business and that elimination of all risk-taking would make it impossible for financial institutions to perform their role in the uh, economy. Let me state the point somewhat differently. If a bank had every loan repaid in full, that's a bank that is not making a lot of good loans. I would urge that the policy objective should be to control and manage risk rather than eliminate it. Thank you. Thank you, Rajan. Harvey? Uh, good morning. Thank you. I'll bring a slightly different view. And I speak from the perspective of experience incurred during that fateful Lehman weekend and three and a half years of administration under Chapter 11. Based upon that experience, the major deficiencies of Dodd-Frank focusing on Title II and the Orderly Liquidation Authority are a failure to recognize that the financial markets and systems have moved ever more rapidly to an interconnected global system in which every part is dependent upon other parts. Taking Lehman as an example, I don't believe that prior to the Lehman collapse, there was a full realization of the global reach of Lehman, its interconnectedness, and the manner in which it did business. The Chapter 11 bankruptcy of Lehman precipitated over 80 independent foreign insolvency proceedings in over 13 major jurisdictions. Each of those insolvency proceedings, in which a receiver or administrator was appointed, pursued a territorial imperative, get control of and administer assets for the benefit of local creditors and their interests. This resulted in enormous issues and problems that consumed literally thousands upon thousands of hours of the time of professionals and the Lehman administrators. Dodd-Frank does not deal in any meaningful manner with the global financial markets and systems. It doesn't recognize that since 2008, financial markets and systems have become more interconnected to create a truly international or perhaps intergalactical financial system. All that is found in Dodd-Frank is a direction that the Board of Governors with the Administrative Office of the U.S. Courts conduct a study regarding international coordination, a report which I understand has been completed, completed but is not definitive. It doesn't solve the problems that became so crucial and time-consuming in the Lehman Chapter 11 cases. It was necessary in those cases to develop international protocols, sequential global meetings, and great flexibility and ability to accommodate. It's doubtful that the FDIC has that capability. Dodd-Frank does not deal as 
uh, Rajan pointed out, the shadow banking system. The banking system since the 1990s has changed dramatically with a huge growth of short-term credit, credit that is not guaranteed by deposit insurance umbrellas that had its origin in the 1930s. Shadow banking accounts currently have about $15 trillion in assets, an amount more than the traditional banking system. The problem it presents is that short-term credit has outraced the ability to protect it. It is complicated by the huge increase in the use of derivatives which are basically another, another source of short-term credit risk. Open derivatives on a notional and indeed on a real basis amount to trillions of dollars. The problem is that a call or a default in a short-term credit situation results in a run on a financial institution. Witness Northern Rock in the, in the United Kingdom. Word of potential problems at a financial institution will result in account withdrawals, demands for more collateral security, and other actions that create panic and cause runs on financial institutions. The consequence may be a crash. Looking at Lehman, although the signs, at least in my, from my perspective, were fairly clear, it was the week of September 7 that caused the panic that resulted in the run on the bank. Lehman's financial condition had been the subject of a lot of media attention during the period in 2008 following the, demi the demise of Bear Stearns. But yet Lehman was able to raise additional equity and basically continue its operations and efforts to reduce leverage through the summer of 2008. However, as the rumors grew louder and Lehman issued its quarterly earnings, the news tightened. Prime brokerage accounts clamored for transfers to other investment banks. Clearing organizations demanded more collateral security as a condition to continued participation in interday and repo financing that aggregated Lehman's reliance on short-term credit and put the nail in the coffin. It happened over a, a few days. Dodd-Frank doesn't appear to have covered the dangers that arise from the shadow banking system and the impact of exogenous events that may, have the, uh, may uh, seriously impair the ability of a financial institution to continue its operations or indeed proceed into an orderly liquidation without great panic, loss, and turmoil. The nature of the business of global financial institutions and global financial markets has given rise to very complex financial organizations. The business of these organizations is co conducted through the use of organizational structures involving thousands of subsidiaries and affiliates. Different types of business lines are centralized into particular subsidiaries, such as derivatives, commercial paper, commercial loans, etc. At the time of the commencement of the Lehman Chapter 11 cases, Lehman had over 8,000 subsidiaries. Of that amount, 400 were very active and up to 3,000 had some function. Many were organized in foreign jurisdictions and subject to foreign laws and regulations. Dodd-Frank doesn't really deal with the issues that arise with that type of organizational structure. A receivership for the parent organization may not give the FDIC as receiver control over the business activities conducted by foreign subsidiaries and affiliates. While it is true that the FDIC may include and subject subsidiaries to the receivership proceeding by appointing itself under Section 210A A1E as the receiver of a covered subsidiary of the covered financial company, provided it is organized under federal laws or state laws, not foreign laws. Uh, uh, the statute doesn't deal with the issues of substantive consolidation of the entities that consume so much time and effort in the Lehman cases. Indeed, the FDIC's arbitrary power to appoint itself as a receiver for a covered subsidiary may give rise to substantial litigation. There is no court review. Dodd-Frank doesn't deal with the rights of creditors of the separate subsidiaries. Will their rights be respected? Question. Under what authority would the FDIC attempt to consolidate the entities if appropriate? There is no court proceeding, such as a bankruptcy court, invested with equitable powers. This is a dramatic hole in the statute. Essentially, the OLA, OLA under Dodd-Frank is a star chamber process. Someplace along the line, it was determined that dictatorships work better than democracies. After all, Mussolini made the trains run on time. Accordingly, in the context of an FDIC receivership, the interests of creditors of various debtors are not paramount. Judicial review is limited, if at all. The position of the FDIC is, if you don't like what the FDIC is doing, you can always bring a plenary action. That's hardly an answer for most creditors. It may be an answer for hedge funds and distressed debt traders who have the wherewithal and the funds to prosecute <coughs> litigation which might be injurious to the process. I'm not sure where a, pl a plenary action would be commenced. 
Would complaining creditors have to go through the Administrative Procedures Act or have immediate access to the federal court system? We are dealing with a statute before the issuance of rules and regulations that consumed more than 2,300 pages of legalese. In the words of a New York judge, it may be viewed as, and I quote, an aggravated assault on the English language. <laughs> James Madison in the Federalist Papers warned that legislation may be so voluminous that it cannot be read or so incoherent that it cannot be understood. The underlying and basic issue of financial regulation is the balancing of the needs for protection of the financial markets and systems for the benefit of creditors, investors, versus the appropriate boundaries for risk taking. The democratization of credit that occurred from the 1960s through almost the first decade of the 21st centuries has aided and abetted by the deregulation of protective regulations and rules that were adopted after the Great Depression of the 1930s exalted the concept of leverage and borrowing as inuring to the benefit of society as a whole. It changed the entire concept of, tr of traditional banking and led to the introduction of opaque esoteric securities that further encouraged short-term borrowing. It rested upon the false premise that markets are self-regulating and self-protective. Protective. Notwithstanding the panic of 2008, that concept of self-regulating markets is being pressed once again by financial institutions. In the drive to create larger profits, they are once again stating that they must expand risk taking so that there can be greater extensions of credit for more dubious transactions so bigger and better bonuses can be paid in those situations uh, to executives and so on. Witness the recent announcement by Deutsche Bank after hiring a significant capital management person from Bank of America that it must expand its risk, risk taking to improve the bottom line. Finally, there has to be a will to regulate. In the Lehman case, an examiner, Tony Volukas, of the firm of Jenner and Block in Chicago, wrote an extensive report on Lehman. A portion of that report deals with regulation. And the bottom line that Tony Volukas came out with was there was no will to regulate. There were regulations in place, but they were not implemented. And there was a dispute between the Federal Reserve Bank of New York and the SEC who had the jurisdiction to, to regulate and oversee Lehman. That will to regulate is a big issue, and whether it is here in the Dodd-Frank remains to be seen. Thank you, Harvey. Mark? I have slides. So if there's technical assistance, this would be a good time. Because I am not sure how to get to them. I think they're, they're down there. Okay. Yeah, I oh, got it. Okay, thank you, thank you. So I'm senior staff at the board in Washington, uh, and let me just augment the usual disclaimer uh, that what I'm about to say is my opinions and not those of the Federal Reserve System or the board, with the fact that experienced journalists will know that only the governors and the members of the FOMC can make policy statements. I don't think I'm going to say anything enormously controversial, uh, but I do want to make sure to say how happy I am to be here and how much I hope that the Richmond Center will continue to have events like this and other work on financial regulation uh, and the financial system, understanding the crisis and reform, uh, because you know, one of the main messages I want to leave you with is an enormous amount of work is really needed uh, in order to continue the job that we are only really a little bit of the way through at this time. In particular, what we need uh, is for reform and regulation to be attentive to the nature of the financial system. In the United States, we have a mixed system. It is a combination of bank-based finance, market-based finance, and shadow banks, where shadow bank, the term shadow bank means something different to each person. Uh, this is in contrast to the traditional pure bank-based system. A exa modern example of that would be some continental European nations, where there's a little bit of market-based finance, but it's pretty much bank-dominated. Now, the crisis in my opinion, 
shook the intellectual foundations of our understanding of how the financial system works and how it should be regulated. Uh, and revisions to that are at early stages. Part of the reason they're at early stages is you have to sweep away the old before you can put in the new, and it takes a while to sweep away the old, and part is because the issues are very difficult. It's my observation that work is proceeding at a rapid pace, and you can't understand what's really happening at the forefront by reading things. The action really is happening in the discussions at meetings like this. Every time I come to a meeting like this, I change my mind about something important about how to move forward. Uh, and that's just because everybody's working hard on a lot of fronts, uh, and you know the forefront is very dynamic. So since we don't have very complete intellectual foundations, naturally, the reform effort to date, which includes more than Basel III and more than Dodd-Frank, is uneven and incomplete. I agree uh, you know, with what Raj and Harvey just said, uh, you know, and I think that was one of their messages. So I'm going to make this argument in a little more detail, uh, and I'll give some examples of open issues and close with some wishes about how I hope we move forward. In particular, you know, I would actually expect, you know, political will for reform to die away over time uh, and before we are really in a position to do the perfect job with reform. But it's important to persevere uh, and try and get ready for the next crisis when there will be an opportunity for more improvements. Okay, so mixed system. In the United States, we have some provision of financial services to the real economy through the traditional deposit taking and loans way of doing things. So that would, a lot of it, for example, of commercial real estate lending or construction lending is done in that uh, way still. Then we have market-based finance. And people who think about market-based finance tend to think in terms of contracts and counterparties. One way to think of it is that financing in the real economy where it is done by a bank, all the different pieces of the job are bundled together inside the bank that is providing the financing. Whereas in markets, the pieces are unbundled. You've got investment bankers, you've got clearing houses, you've got rating agencies, you've got a lot of players. And you know, different pieces of the job are spread out all over the place. Then there are shadow banks. What's an example of a shadow bank? There are a wide variety of them. Some of them are essential to market-based finance. Some of them are analogous to bank-based finance. GE Capital is a shadow bank. MF Global was a shadow bank. But there are a lot of other shadow bank type entities out there as well, and they're important. Now, it's important to understand that although a lot of the discussion of what went wrong in the crisis and what should be reformed tends to focus on the major banks. The reality is that this crisis was as much or more one of the market-based part of the system and of the shadow banks as of bank-based finance. And so to the extent that our reform effort focuses solely on the major banks, obviously we're going to be missing parts of the system that had a heck of a lot of trouble uh, and caused a lot of trouble for our economy. Now, the three parts of the system are linked. They affect each other. But when you get into trouble, it is quite difficult to rapidly transfer activity from one part of the system to another. If part of the system is bank-based finance and the banks get in trouble, it's difficult just operationally for shadow banks and markets to quickly take over. And the same thing happened when market-based finance broke down. One thing I've also observed uh, and this is a recommendation for you, I suppose, uh, is that when I hear individuals talking about reform, often they focus on reforming the part of the system that they are most familiar with. Okay, so I'm a shadow professor. I sit at the Federal Reserve Board, but I'm a research guy when I have the time to do research. And so I interact a lot with uh, faculty in universities, especially in business schools, 
most of them really focus on markets-based finance. And so when I hear them talking about reform, they're particularly focused on clearing of derivatives, on repo markets, on what went wrong during the flash crash, so forth and so on. They don't talk very much about the, the role of the big banks, except to the extent that the big banks are part of the market-based system. On the other hand, somebody who's done banking their whole life tends not to pay much attention to the market-based part of the system. So when you are trying to parse what you read and hear about recommendations of reform, it's good to look at the history and mindset of the person who is writing or speaking because they are likely to have a view that is incomplete. Okay, so I mentioned that we should sweep away the old. What was the old consensus? Well, you know, the old consensus, I would say, didn't have a very good idea of what could go wrong with market-based finance, and it paid almost no attention to shadow banks at all. It was mostly focused on banks, standard traditional banks. And the consensus was that moral hazard was the main problem, primarily because of the existence of the government. Counterparties to banks would not discipline them properly, so they would take excessive risk. Risk would build up in the system. It would blow up, and we would all pay the price. And the answer of the old consensus to this was get the government out of the game as much as possible, and then counterparties would discipline them. Now, there was another part of the old consensus, and that paid attention to the fact that we had a mixed system. This other part came along really in the last 20 years when people noticed that in the face of a number of crises, such as the Asia crisis or the Russia crisis, the U.S. financial system was pretty resilient. People said it must be that it's good to have a mixture of bank-based and market-based finance because when one of them gets in trouble, the other one can kind of take over. Well, people don't really seem to think that anymore, and with good reason, because if things go wrong badly enough in market-based finance, they're going to go wrong with the banks too, and vice versa. Now, diagnosis of what went wrong in the crisis is ongoing, and that's very important to help us get to a new framework. Um, we do not yet have that framework in place. There are snippets of it, uh, and those are important because they can build, get built together. Okay, so let me just quickly run through. I have far more slides than I can talk about. Let me quickly run through just a few examples of things that I regard as open issues that are of the first magnitude of importance. I'm not going to try and you know talk about each one of these. Let me just pick out a few. Another dimension. Uh, that one can look at somebody and ask what are they talking about is, are they talking about solvency problems or liquidity problems? This was, above all, a liquidity crisis. And, but there are lots of people who still think of it solely through the lens of solvency. When there is a fire sale of assets, solvency and liquidity are inseparable. How does one think in an orderly fashion about the solvency of an institution when a Ginny May security is trading at 75. Now, running down the list, so it's a liquidity crisis. How are you going to regulate it? That's very difficult. And when the crisis comes, how are you going to fight it? Before this crisis, the answer to that was the discount window, or more generally, emergency lending arrangements. The discount window didn't work, and neither did traditional emergency lending arrangements. That's because of the stigma. Northern Rock failed because they went to the Bank of England's version of the discount window. So just when you need it, if you go, you are dead. So we need to find ways to have liquidity support that are going to work in a crisis. There is the question of intervention. This is very politically charged because after intervention happens, there is always outrage. But if you are going to intervene, I have heard the Treasury say on more than one occasion, you should do so early and with overwhelming force. I believe that's correct, because if you're going to intervene, you want it to work. You do not want to mess around and do things in a half-hearted fashion, such as some of our friends across the ocean have done over the last year or so. But if it's time, to intervene, if you're going to intervene, there is the question of when. 
You don't want to do it too early because it does cause extra moral hazard problems, but you don't want to do it too late because it's much more expensive. There is no framework to help people understand how to make the decision in real time and therefore no framework for how to modify the statutes to give guidance and put constraints on the interveners. So, as I mentioned, we have uneven progress. When you look at Dodd-Frank in particular, of course, it was done a couple of years ago now. And I would say the old consensus was a lot more dominant than it is now at that time. And so you see a lot of Dodd-Frank that implicitly or explicitly is directed at the moral hazard problem. But since the crisis was so big and so many things went wrong, it also includes a lot of pragmatic measures that are targeted at problems that were revealed by the crisis. It has, in, to my eye, a heavy focus on banks because that's where the intellectual foundations were most developed. All right, so I want to say that the reform effort encompasses a lot more than Dodd-Frank and Basel III. It's impossible to talk about everything is happening that is happening. I do not know all about it. I don't think there is ever anyone who knows all the details of everything that is happening, down to the fine details. There are people who know broadly what is happening, but it's a big job, and so it is divided up. So what I've done here is take Dodd-Frank and Basel III and kind of divide it into these three sectors. First, I would put the Financial Stability Oversight Council. One of the hopes of Dodd-Frank is that the council will fill in gaps over time, okay, so that the Congress doesn't have to. We don't know whether that will work or not. It's also supposed to do macroprudential things. When I just look at a high level at Dodd-Frank and Basel II, the things which I think are addressing banks and shadow banks are Basel III, the whole notion of systemically important financial institutions, that's a byproduct of really the word too big to fail. What we see is big, right? But there were lots of things in the crisis that failed and had important repercussions that were not big. Nevertheless, this is what we have. There's Volcker rule. It's very much focused on bank activities, not so much on CIFIs. And there's a whole lot of details of Federal Reserve and other regulatory agency supervision and regulation. On market-based finance, there's central clearing of derivatives, there's securitization, there's rating agencies. These are all things that either <coughs> went wrong or in the case of central clearing, we realize that if that had gone wrong, the clearing did go wrong, it would be an enormous problem. There's a little bit about crisis management. There's a little bit about plumbing in general. And there's some stuff about the mortgage process and consumer protection. So to my eye, it's uneven in its coverage of banks, shadow banks, and market-based finance. And that's because the intellectual consensus is lacking. So that's a hint about where more work needs to be done. OK. So I'm going to run out of time momentarily. You know, implicit in my list of things that we don't understand let me just focus on a couple of things on this list. I said that in my opinion, it was a liquidity crisis. That doesn't mean that solvency was not important, but that's what made it different uh, than some other crises, uh, at least that we have experienced in Europe and in the U.S. So here are some questions that, in my opinion, nobody has a really adequate answer to. What's liquid when? You know, a couple of uh, years ago, one would have said that European Union sovereign debt would be liquid all the time. Obviously, we don't think that anymore. When there is a li systemic liquidity problem, only central banks can fix it. Anything else is a fantasy. However, as I said earlier, the discount window doesn't work. So how are they going to fix it? How are you going to regulate it? And how is it linked with solvency? These are questions which, when I'm wearing my research hat, I would love to be able to answer. I don't know how. <laughs>
there are snippets of new ideas about this, but no orderly framework. Let me say something about complexity. Some days I wear a risk management expert hat. The world is complex. There are a lot of very good people who are chief risk officers and working for chief risk officers. There are not enough of them, in my opinion, who are really high powered enough to manage every single thing that we see out there. And of course, that's also true with the regulators. There are, are just not enough experienced people at this point, and the problems are very, very difficult to solve. And details matter. Implicit in what my fellow panelists were saying is that the details really matter. And you might have to toil away in the trenches for 10 years on something to get the job done, and it will be unfashionable for nine of those years. So I think this has implications for how we organize things. If we, for example, presume that regulators and supervisors can deal effectively with an infinite amount of complexity, that is perhaps unrealistic. So we have to find ways to do it. In the real economy, people find ways to do it. People do supply chains, right? Global supply chains for complex manufacturing, and they make it work. This is an area where we need more thinking. OK, so uh, my time is up. What are my, wish my wishes? Well, I wish we had more understanding. And thus, I like meetings like this. Uh, I wish we took a broader view in the public debate and thought about the nature of the financial system. I hope we'll be humble. And rather than having grand redesign ideas without a foundation, we will do pragmatic incrementalism while trying to get the foundation. I think Dodd-Frank is something, you know, is helpful in that regard. It is a mixture of, you know, basis on an intellectual foundation and incrementalism. And as I said at the beginning, I hope we'll prepare for the next reform opportunity. When I think about the academic literature on the Great Depression, it spent 50 years, five zero years, deciding what was the one cause. And eventually, as Chairman Bernanke said, it was the Fed's fault, okay, <laughs> way back when. But that's too simplistic. There were a lot of causes, and it took too long to have a debate that ended up not being all that operational, really. We need to make faster progress, and I hope we can. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Mark. Before we open it up to, for Q&A, let me just turn to a topic that will loom large, I'm sure, in the discussion that follows about too big to fail, too interconnected to fail. And I just wonder what the panelists think about the current regulatory landscape. To what extent does, for example, Dodd-Frank or other uh, regulatory responses to the crisis mitigate this problem, exacerbate this problem, or do nothing about this problem? Where do we stand? Well, I'm going to maybe start by trying to reinforce a key point which uh, Harvey made and which, with which I fully agree, where Dodd-Frank is clearly lacking, and it couldn't go any further, uh, is dealing with the extraterritorial nature, the global uh, significance footprint of our largest financial institutions. Uh, that is going to need some form of international consensus, uh, although it is interesting that the FDIC recently did a heat map exercise and found that 88 uh, percent of the assets and liabilities of our five major banks in this country were located in no more than three jurisdictions and on average 90 percent in the UK. So this is a problem which is ultimately soluble, but as, as Harvey, I think, totally accurately points out, unless we solve it, we still have the too big to fail problem. Uh, I think we have to recognize that since 2008, the institutions have gotten bigger and more complex. So that we have bigger institutions and too big to fail may leach into too big to manage. Uh, as the institutions get bigger and bigger, they become much more difficult to administer. If you look back at Citibank pre-2008, pre it had gotten so big that it was not manageable anymore. And I still think that notwithstanding the comment that too big to fail is over, uh, 
I think there will be situations, if we have panics, in which you may again see a piece of legislation to save the country from a disaster. So I think we should first think about why are we worried about too big to fail? And, you know, the very phrase too big to fail tends to focus our attention on a solution, which is let them fail. So one reason why the public doesn't like the phenomenon called too big to fail is that they perceive that they are going to bear the direct costs, the out-of-pocket costs of a rescue. In my opinion, 20 years ago, Fiducia pretty much took care of that problem, and it kind of worked uh, in this crisis in the sense that the costs of resolving banks that failed or were, some people would say, rescued, you know, sold uh, over a weekend, are going to be borne by the industry because where money came in, uh, either it was TARP money that has all been recaptured, uh, or if it came out of the FDIC, the FDIC recovers it from the industry. Crisis costs that are really important are the macroeconomic costs. We're bearing horrendous costs, you know, and so uh, what's another reason why we don't like too big to fail? It's because we think there's not enough market discipline. Uh, you know, there's always an element of experimentation when one is trying to change the behavior of market participants. But it seems to me that Dodd-Frank has taken a reasonable shot at it, and there are discussions in the regulatory community of additional reasonable shots. To a first approximation, the entities that got rescued, their shareholders pretty much got wiped out. Uh, and then, so what we have left is the creditors. And there are various ideas floating around like bail-in debt uh, and things in addition to what's in the statute to try and make sure that creditors take haircuts. So, you know, I don't think any of us knows what is the best way to get more market discipline. Uh, but I think there are a number of experiments in progress. I think we also have to ask ourselves the extent to which market participants really exert discipline during the boom, even if they are really exposed. Okay, thank you. Can I add, I, there are two issues. There's the issue, how do you prevent a disaster, which I guess is title one of Dodd-Frank and supervision, and then if the disaster occurs, how you deal with it. There's a lot of emphasis on creditors and stockholders or equity holders should pay for it, and it shouldn't be the taxpayer. Well, in bankruptcy, if you look at Lehman, the creditors and the equity holders are all paying for it. The government's not paying anything. The question is, how do you prevent the failure? And what action do you take? And that goes back to the will to regulate. And if you look pre-2008, I think the, the best amount, people say the best and the brightest were all on Wall Street. And they just outpaced all the regulators. And the consequence of that was the creation of a, an economy in which uh, leverage was important so that you can have entities that could, could get up to, on a reporting basis, 44 to 1. So that for every dollar of equity, you had $44 of debt. And if you, if you looked in the mid-reporting period, it was probably close to 55 to 1. Well, if you allow that, and it was deemed to be that was the greatest invention since the beginning of finance, it, it, it fueled an economy where everybody could buy a house whether they could afford it or not. If that's the kind of economy that you're going, to, you're going to support and sponsor, ultimately you're going to have a panic. And the concept of intervention, I don't think is new. If you go back into history, either there was J.P. Morgan who intervened, and then when it, we got to, uh, I guess, the panic of 1907 or something, which we, we resulted in the Federal Reserve, and then you go through uh, all of the so-called crises, the, the great salad oil crisis in the, in the stock market in 1963 after President Kennedy was assassinated, uh, the New York Stock Exchange intervened. And then you go to uh, the 1970s when uh, member firms of the New York Stock Exchange were being liquidated. The stock exchange again intervened with a, tr with a special trust fund. And then you go to long-term capital management, and there was intervention. The, the 08 crisis was so big that it could not be handled except by the government. 
I want to just uh, close by offering a token of appreciation from the Richmond Center to our panelists for participating and a round of applause for this great panel. Thank you.